In this lecture, we're going to talk about the International Phonetic Alphabet, phonetic transcription, and the linguistic description of words, specifically learning to identify morphemes. As we saw in the previous lecture, English has many instances where one sound can be written two different ways, and where two sounds can be written the same. The International Phonetic Alphabet, or IPA, is a special writing system where every symbol represents a single speech sound, and every speech sound is assigned a different symbol. In other words, there are no groups of allographs or different ways of writing the same sound, like there are in ordinary English spelling. Furthermore, the International Phonetic Alphabet was designed so that anyone can learn to write down and identify the sounds of any language in the world. So, if two sounds are the same in two different languages, then they will be represented by the same symbol in the IPA, no matter what their symbols are in the writing systems of each language. And any time a new sound is discovered in a language, a new symbol has to be created in the International Phonetic Alphabet. This slide shows my favorite meme, the linguist llama. We're going to be seeing a bit more of him in this course, and I hope, like me, from now on, whenever you see IPA beer, you'll think of the IPA, not beer. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to tell you a few facts about the International Phonetic Alphabet and some rules for transcription. First of all, it can get confusing trying to determine whether something we see written down refers to a word in English spelling or its transcription in the IPA. To help with this, we use special symbols when we are doing phonetic transcription. Phonetic transcriptions are always written down either between slashes or brackets. We'll talk more about the difference between these, but for now, all of our transcriptions will use the slashes. To identify a word in its English spelling, we'll put the letters in quotation marks. Over the next few slides, I'm going to briefly go over the symbols in the IPA alphabet for the sounds that we will cover in the next few weeks. Some of the symbols will be familiar to you from English spelling and will seem to correspond with their sounds pretty well. Most of these cases will be for the consonant sounds. However, there will be many new symbols that you must learn to recognize and learn the symbol to sound correspondence for. You also need to learn to write these symbols correctly in handwriting. Some of the IPA symbols, particularly for some of the vowel sounds, will look familiar but will correspond to different sounds than what you might expect. However, if you know French or Spanish, some of these symbols may match the spelling of sounds from that language. Many of the symbols may be new to you and it may require some effort to learn to make them correctly in handwriting. You will be given feedback about your attempts to write the phonemes in your own handwriting. Some of that feedback might seem picky to you, but many common variations that would be acceptable when writing in English can be the same or similar to other IPA symbols, possibly believe in ones that you won't learn in this class. Therefore, an unclear or messy version of the written phonemes might be confusing to a reader of your transcriptions. Remember, when you are transcribing, you may be writing down differences in pronunciation that won't even make a real word. So your reader can't use context to determine what letter you meant, like they can in regular handwriting. In your book, and in a handout posted online, there is a word list with sample words for each phoneme. The IPA charts in the book show more phonemes than the ones we're going to use in this class. You should have a handout with phoneme charts for the vowels and consonants that show just the symbols that we're going to use in this class. This slide shows the IPA symbols in a chart for the consonants that we're going to use in this class. The first column of the chart shows the way in which each sound is produced. The top row lists the places of articulation for each sound and each sound is labeled according to whether it is voiceless or voiced. We're going to talk about these features of each sound later in the course in more detail. I'm going to say each sound, starting with the row labeled stop. It may help to see my lips when I say each one, which is why I've turned on the web camera for this lecture. I'll say a word as an example for each one. Here we go. First are the stop sounds. The first sound is p as in pop. The next sound is b, as in bob. Next is t, as in top. d, as in dog. k, as in cop. g, as in god. And finally, the glottal stop, which is the middle sound in uh-oh. 
In the next row are the fricative sounds. They are f as in frog, v as in violin, th as in think, th as in there, s as in Sam, z as in zebra, sh as in show, j as in the middle sound in treasure, and h as in happy. In the third row are the two affricate sounds, ch as in chocolate, and j as in job. In the next row are the nasal sounds, m as in Mary, n as in nap, and ng as in the last sound in ring. The fifth row are the liquid sounds, u as in laugh, and r as in rob, the first sound in rob. Finally, in the last row are the glide sounds, w as in what, and y as in young. This slide shows the IPA symbols in a chart for the vowels that we're going to use in this class. The chart is divided into three main rows labeled high, mid, and low according to how high the jaw is when they're produced. This chart is also divided into three main columns, front, central, and back, which indicates the position of the tongue within the mouth during their production, whether it is more towards the front of the mouth or the back of the mouth. Again, we're going to talk about these features later in the course in more detail. Now I'll say each of the vowels for you. Here we go. The front vowels are E as in bead, I as in bid, A as in bade, E as in bed, and A as in bad. Going down the back, the back vowels are U as in food, U as in foot, O as in boat, A as in bought, and A as in Bob or father. You might have a hard time at first distinguishing between the ah sound as in Bob and the ah sound as in bought, but with practice you will catch on. One thing that helps is that the ah sound as in Bob is produced with the lips not rounded. The ah sound as in bought is produced with the lips rounded. To practice making the difference between the two, say the ah sound and then move your jaw up a little and round your lips and push them out a little bit and say the sound again, like this. Ah, 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 ah. With your lips rounded, you should get the ah sound. In my dialect, I make that sound in a lot of words, like caught and fought and bought. You might not make this sound and instead pr produce them more like caught and fought and bot. You are most likely to make the aw sound in words with vowels spelt with the letters aw, like law and draw, and in words that end in all, like fall, call, and maul. The first two central vowels are the stressed and unstressed versions of the a uh sound. The stressed version occurs in stressed syllables. It is the vowel in bud and we call it symbol turned V because it looks like an upside down V. The unstressed version is the second vowel in the word sofa and we call it symbol schwa. It looks like a backwards and upside down E. The other two central vowels are the stressed and unstressed versions of the er vowel. The stressed version occurs in stressed syllables and it's the vowel in the word bird. It's not the same as the R consonant that occurs in the beginning of the word red. Red versus bird. The unstressed version of the ER vowel is the second vowel in mother or butter. The last three vowel sounds are on the bottom right of the slide and they are I as in ride, ow as in loud, and oi as in boy. We call these three vowels the strong diphthongs. If you make these sounds and hold your fingers on your chin as you say them, you can notice how your jaw changes position as you say them. I, ow, 
boy. It is this change in position during production that makes them diphthongs. That is why we transcribe them with two symbols. The I sound moves from a low central to a high front position as you say it. The owl sound moves from a low central to a high back position as you say it. And the oi sound goes from a lower mid back to a high front position as you say it. So you raised your jaw during the production of each of these sounds. Notice that the A sound and the O sound also have two symbols in their transcription. That's because they also change articulatory position somewhat during their production. In both of them, A and O, the jaw moves to a slightly higher position during their production, but not nearly as much as for the strong diphthongs. That's why we call them the weak diphthongs. In this slide, the linguist Lama is showing us one of the hazards of doing phonetics. If you're saying these words and sounds along with me, you might have to explain to someone that no, you're not having a stroke, you're just learning phonetics.